Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Ozzie. Marissa and I are going to give you the tools, the tricks, the tips, and the stumbling blocks to the writing process. But also, we're hoping to give you the behind the scenes perspective from the industry side, from the author side, and everything in between. So, basically, we want to give you guys the tools it takes to. I don't know, just navigate the process of writing a book and getting it on a shelf and make it as less scary as possible because it can be really intimidating. So we're on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so make sure to click the link below to subscribe and be alerted ahead of every episode. So we're really excited to have you guys here. What are we talking about today? Today we're going to talk about writing crime uh, for what I imagine will not be the only time because it is a hugely hugely popular section of the publishing market. Um, most of the publishers I've worked at, not Scholastic, that would be weird. Um, I have an extensive crime list. Uh, so I've had the pleasure of working with lots of crime writers in my career. I, the craziest thing to me is, about that has always been just how normal these people who can write about really like, dark and twisted things are. Um, and I think that's fascinating. Um, all of them, all of them are so far away from the characters they create. <laughs> Um, the, the characters that they write, but often crime writers are on their second careers, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, yeah. You know, it does, that doesn't always happen with, with all other parts of the list, but with crime writers, oftentimes they've been inspired by their day jobs. And, you know, today we're going to talk with our guest about how reality can inspire fiction. And when you have had a career with the police or law or similar... Yeah, it's it's funny that you said that that crime writers are normally like opposite people because it, now I'm just trying to think. It makes me a little bit nervous because you think, are they plotting something <laughs> while they're smiling and being really nice? Um, they're not. Know. They're not. They're just nice. They're not nice in a creepy way. They're just just really nice. Yeah. But the other thing that fascinates me about crime writing, I I could never try it even just for fun. I think it's really an intimidating genre to write because the sense of foreboding in the language, the nuance, um, you know, without being really obvious, I, I genuinely don't know how they do it because the re uh, really successful crime writers, the language just kind of makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And it's, it's really quite compelling. And I'm really fascinated by how somebody does that. And how, especially if you, like our guest today, have written a debut novel that then gets a two book, two book deal, mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's really compelling. And that obviously, like she hit on something that was really quite special. How do you do that? Also, how do you navigate that genre? You know, is it the same as everything else? Or is there like a particular spin you have to put on it, the way you market it? I mean, yeah. Yes. Uh, sure, I think that um, something about crime writing, we, it's so widely consumed, right? And a, and a lot of crime is very, you know, what we call mass market fiction, you know, it's, it really appeals to the masses. Mm. That said, it's also like you've said, like you just pointed out, it's, it, it, I think, an incredibly difficult thing to write. It's an incredibly difficult space to be, you know, new and unique in. It's in, an incredibly difficult space to find unique voices. So I yeah. think one of the things that is really is really compelling about, about crime writers is people who, who sort of draw on real life. Yeah, and I think, you know, for somebody who, I just wonder, is it easier if you are, somebody that comes from that world if you're a barrister if you're you know an ex-police officer if you're an, a detective does mm -hmm. it get easier to write that or like how do you separate your real life from what you're writing and i think and also i i wonder if people just look at a whole bunch of crime novels and think well it's all the same mm -hmm. but it's really not because every every novel that i've picked up that is in that genre, they're all so different. They all have very clear voices. Yeah. I just, I find that really interesting. Yeah. So typically we would talk a little bit more about this from our perspective, uh, but this is something that you need to hear directly from, from the person uh, that we have 
on with us today. So she is an author and a barrister who specializes in crime and prison law. So she needs to tell us about this. Yeah. So we're going to bring on Leah Middleton. I'm, I'm hugely excited because Leah and I have had kind of chats and I've seen her, the, the process by which she's kind of, you know, I've, I've been witness to kind of behind the scenes because of the power of Instagram. Um, so yeah, it'll be great to bring her on. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. It's really exciting. <laughs> so I'm going to just introduce you briefly. Mm -hmm. um, you are our guest author today, which we are very excited about. Uh, you've just snagged a two book deal, right? More on that a little bit later with Michael Joseph, which is a part of Penguin Random House. And uh, after you submitted your debut novel and were taken on by Kate Burke at Blake Friedman. So your first book titled When They Find Her is set to come out in the UK in spring of 2021 which it feels like is never going to come. <laughs> Let it come. <laughs> uh, so welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you. It's really, really lovely to be here. Thank you so much. So because, you know, we approach it from both sides. So I approach it from the creative side. Marissa approaches the process from more of the industry side. So I'll start with just firstly asking, what are you working on now? So at the moment, I've been working on book two for the two book deal. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's um, sort of it's crime, but with sort of like a psychological element in there. Um, but it's the main character is a prosecutor. Um, so that's what I used to do. I used to prosecute. And I've always been fascinated with the idea of having a prosecutor as the main character. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of crime fiction where the lead is a defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be really interesting to come from the prosecutor side. But I wouldn't really call it a legal thriller. It's definitely still um, more sort of crime psychological. But um, yeah, she's a prosecutor who comes across someone from her past, basically, and that's as far as I'll go with that one. Yeah. Um, but then I'm also having to do the tricky part of being under contract, which is switch back and forth. Yeah. So just tonight, I've got some more edits for book one for when they find her. Um, so I'm now going to have to switch back to that and stop on the drafting. Oh, God. Which yeah. Is yeah, it throws me a little bit trying to get back into my main character's head from when they find her. That must, that must be really, like, how do you compartmentalize then? It's like, that's, I mean. I find it easier to switch, so to go back to when they find her because I only wrote as that protagonist for so long. Yeah. And it's, it's just the one view throughout the book, it's just Naomi. Um, and I've been writing her since 2017. So I feel like, that is my voice, like, so, but it's the switch back, forcing myself back into book two feels quite hard because I'm still not used to the voice of the main character. Yeah, and I think a lot of authors have said that uh, when we spoke to them, it's like the first book is the, the more comfortable mm -hmm. space because you weren't under any pressure. You heard that, you lived with that character and those voices for a long time, you know. Exactly, um, whereas, and I mean, she developed over a number of years before I got an agent Then we did more edits. And then with my editor, I've done even more. So her voice is really, really strong. It's developed over a long time. Whereas this new protagonist, I'm going to have to develop her in like a year. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm deadline. So it's um, it feels quite daunting. But um, yeah. the big worry was that the voice would be the same that they wouldn't sound different, but yep. um, almost straight away, it was a very different style and her voice just sounds, yeah, unique. So I'm really pleased about that. Yeah. So in, in developing now your characters for the second book, mm -hmm. the seed, that idea for this book, is that, did you come up with it and develop it in a different way to your first book or that aha moment, that kind of moment where you thought, okay, this is what the story is going to be about. Did it change or was it the same? It, it was definitely different to the way book one sort of developed. Um, 
I got the idea for when they find her a long time ago, like a lot, like 10 years ago. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, it's obviously changed um, and it's changed over the time that I've written it, but it, it very much was an organic process developing that idea. Whereas this book two, my agent said to me, right, we're going on submission. I want to send up like a blurb for book two. Um, so you need to give me something. And at that point I hadn't decided, I had a whole notebook just with like random scribblings that might sort of develop <laughs> an idea, but nothing concrete. I was like, oh, I have to write a blurb and it's got to sound compelling. How am I going to do this? Wow. Um, so then it was kind of the amalgamation of three, like three strands of things that I knew I wanted to write about. And I saw them on the page and thought those three things would actually go together really well. And then I created a blurb and then I've created an outline off of the back of a blurb. So it's like I've started with like the end product. Mm -hmm. so to speak. Oh. And it's been very different way of working. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely felt less organic, but I guess mm -hmm. going forward, each book is going to be less organic than book one because you have all the time in the world to write book one. Yeah, and that's and that's the common theme. I think most people would say that. I think you know the the process changes slightly because you also have a team of people that are kind of giving you deadlines, and there's more expectation. Mm. So, you know, there's it's must be really difficult to kind of find that headspace to have the same kind of feeling and same process that you did with you know, the first one that you would with the second or even third. And I think like, and having said that, do you find that less the aha moment, but now kind of when you write, do you find that the process has changed, especially now during kind of lockdown? Do you feel like it's harder to find that process or? Um, I mean, lockdown has added a whole different Mm -hmm. I can't just because the kids are there and then I'm still working full time so it's just a bit bizarre but um I think in terms of process um I've been really strict with myself this time in terms of outlining yeah. um partly because of what I learned from book one <laughs> and yeah. also because I'm on a deadline now so I've Book one, I keep on calling it book one, like it doesn't have a title, but <laughs> when they find her, um, was very pantsy. Um, so even though it was crime and I knew that I should plot because it was it would help me in the long run, I just kind of went for it. Yeah. So I ended up having to rewrite a lot and a lot got deleted. <laughs> so this time I said, you know, I've got a deadline and I don't want to fall into those same traps um, so I've literally done a strict chapter by chapter outline, everything, anything I can think of goes into the outline. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been, I've, I've tried to be a lot more strict with myself, but I'm struggling with time because really the only time I can write is in the evenings once the kids are in bed. Yeah. It's been, it's been tough. Yeah. And how, and how do you, how do you separate your work self from your writing self? Um, oh, is that even possible? I don't even know. <laughs> it's, it's hard. I found used to find it a lot harder when I was prosecuting um, to sort of switch off that part because so much about prosecuting, you know, when you're standing up in court, you're essentially a storyteller. You're trying to get across that side of the story, that side of the case. Yeah. Um, so it was quite difficult to turn off between the two and when I was developing ideas I'd often find that I'd sort of be bringing in things that I'd seen in real life um whereas now that I am like a public lawyer, so I advise on criminal law and um prison law but I'm not actively in the court system or anything um so it is easier to switch off now but I mean, I still read a lot of cases that, you know, as I'm reading them, I'm like, oh, this would be an amazing story. Oh, Michael, sorry. Um, <laughs> that went through your living room. It was right outside. Um, 
Yeah, so there's still things that I find myself quite drawn to, but it is, it's easier to switch off at the moment. Um, but it's just at the moment, it's the distinction for everyone, I think, of having your work life at home with you and then trying to switch off between work and writing when you're in the same environment all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's there's, no escape. there's no escape. Yeah. No. <sighs> so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what's interesting is that you know, you, you're coming at it from a really like fascinating perspective for me kind of creatively because I, I don't, I don't understand kind of the, the details that would go into crime writing. And I think, you know, you have a very specific process, obviously. It probably helps you. I'm not a planner. I can't, uh, you know, the, it just comes out. Mm. I probably would do maybe with nonfiction. But like with fiction, I just feel like it's a kind of the pieces just fall together in my head and then it comes out. Mm -hmm. I think do you, I wonder if crime, writing a crime novel, because there's so much detail, it helps you plot out? I think that um, naturally for me, my, my sort of natural state of writing would be to just write as I go. Yeah. And just want to do it organically like that. Um, and I, a lot of my friends who write crime or authors that I know who write crime have said the same thing. You know, their instinct is to just write, but <laughs> they've all fallen foul of the not plotting. And with crime, it's just so easy to write yourself into a corner. And, you know, you're having to write the plot, but then you're having to write the red herrings, the foreshadowing the you know the twists and it's just it's I don't think it's possible without no at least some semblance of an outline um so it I mean I still find myself um I think I'm like 10 chapters in now to book two but I still find myself sort of starting to write a scene that I haven't planned I'm like oh yeah this goes amazingly here and I let myself write it because if I, I think it will just completely stilt my creativity if I'm like, no, stick to the plan. Yeah. So I let myself write it, but then I go back to my outline and try and amend it accordingly. So I, so the outline is still like a live being, yeah. so to speak. But it, um, I don't think I could do it now without it. Just because, like you've said, there's so much detail that goes into pulling off a crime novel properly. Yeah, of course. Um, so it's, yeah, it's pretty vital, I think. I'm sure there's some people who can probably do it without one, but yeah, not me at the moment. <laughs> also, I think that uh, as you know, we talked about earlier in the episode, a lot of people who write, who write crime, and of course this is not everyone, but, but many people have had some experience mm -hmm. you know, in, in, their, uh, in their daily life with yeah. that before. And I think those, you, you have the kind of mind that lends itself to, you know, that, that list formation and sort of yeah. to things to reference to make sure that you haven't gotten anything wrong and you haven't, you know, exactly. anything or discounted the work that you've done already or, you know, mm -hmm. so I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. And I am, I am curious now. So did you, did you always want to write? Did you had aspirations of being a writer or is it something that you just you started to feel like as you, as you said before it's it's a bit like storytelling so yeah I um I've always been so since I was little like books were my thing like just obsessed I used to read constantly um and when I was little you know I used to like write little stories and then like growing up going into secondary school and so sort of like 12 13 I used to write stories in the back of my like English workbook and ask my teacher to look at them <laughs> I know like extra I don't yeah but um and he used to do it he was seeing people <laughs> um so I always used to like writing but I just I never considered it as a way to make a living for some reason um and then I went to university to drama and theater I didn't even do I didn't do law um and then I, I converted over to law and then that was the focus for a long time because it has to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I think the thing that really pushed me back to wanting to write was when I had my, my kids, well, my daughter came first and it wasn't until I'd had her, I'd been off with her. Um, I'd just gone back from maternity leave and I was like, what are you doing? You're like, you want to write, why aren't you writing? 
Um, so that's when I started. Um, so yeah, I've always, I've always, I'd say, been a writer, right. but I just never pursued it um, as a career until recently. Sure. And so, how did you find that your career has informed? Um, um, sorry, so you know, you don't have to say names. <laughs> well, I think um, it's interesting. I, I think that sort of both career, well, the failed career path of wanting to be an actor <laughs> and then becoming a barrister, I think have both really informed the way I write. Um, sort of the, the way I get into character to write is very actory. Um, I sort of force myself to become the character and then I start writing. Um, and a lot of that is to do with music, uh -huh. um, which is what I used to do as an actor. But um, in terms of criminal law, I mean, it's interesting what you were saying at the beginning about does it help or could it possibly hinder? Because I think it does both. Um, I mean, it's like a feeding ground for story ideas. Um, there's just so many interesting people that most people wouldn't wouldn't come across in their regular worlds. Um, so there's so much inspiration in terms of character, just sitting in a courtroom and watching the people in that room. It's, just, it's, it's fascinating, I love it. Um, but then yeah, in terms of sort of plot ideas or, and sometimes it won't even be from things I've actually seen in real life. It's just a headline in the papers, just anything. Um, but I've always found that world very fascinating. Um, but it can also massively hinder because I become over obsessed with the detail and getting it perfectly right. right. Um, and that can become a bit all consuming. And then it takes away the, yeah. there's no way of getting what I don't think there is, certainly not in, I mean, I don't write police procedural stuff. So definitely not in, you know, my style of book. I don't think it's possible to get everything perfectly right in terms of police procedure, court procedure, and still have an entertaining book. Because yeah. it, it's well, so there's, 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 there's a danger of overwriting at that point. Isn't exactly. It? There's a massive danger of overwriting, putting in detail that the reader doesn't need to know about how the court system works. Yeah. And then also just, you know, the court trials can take forever. They can take months to get to even get into the courtroom. And if you want to start from when the crime happens, like how do you make it to the courtroom without a year past it? So that kind of stuff is constantly going off in my head. I'm like, right, no, story first, and yep. then we'll figure out the intricacies of like the law. We don't need to think about that now. So um yeah, it's uh, my job is constantly in my head when I'm uh, definitely when I'm plotting. Um and plotting is the hardest bit for me. Um, and I think that contributes to it as well. Uh, so when you first, uh, when you first had your, your bill signed, mm -hmm. you, it was, it was for two books. So did you know at the time that did you talk this through with your agent? Did you know that you had the second book in you? Did that come from the publisher? Did they request it? Can you talk a little bit more about how that happened? Yeah. So, um, Kate had, told me that, yeah, she was going to send off a blurb for book two. She said, two book deal, you know, isn't guaranteed, but they're getting more common in the UK. Um, so we want a second book, at least a blurb of a second book up our sleeves to be like, look, you could have this as well. Right. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that went off with um, when they find her. Right. And then um, it all happened really quickly. Um, so she said to me, oh, I'm, I'm getting good noise, is the way she phrased it. Good noise from editors. And um, they all seem to like the idea for book two as well. So she kind of phrased it like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I started thinking, oh, you know, could this be a two book deal? And I said to her, you, how likely do you think a two book deal is? And she said, well, let's just wait and see. <laughs> um, so, but I, I mean, I know from sort of following the trade deals and other people's deals, you know, in the UK, I don't know what it's like over there in the US, but in the UK, two book deals are definitely getting more, mm -hmm. they're, they're much more common. 
Yeah. Um, so then, so yeah, I'd gone on submission on the Wednesday and then on the Friday, she told me that she was getting good noise. Mm -hmm. And then the Monday we got the first offer, wow. um, which was from Michael Joseph. Yeah. Um, and it was from them, they said, yeah, two books, mm -hmm. hardback, paperback, ebook audio. Um, so it was just kind of like, oh my God. And then it was that week I spoke to my editor on the phone yeah. and Kate said to me, you know, I'm not certain whether they want book two that we sent or whether they'll want a different book two. So then I started panicking that I was going to have to come up with a different book two. <laughs> I'm just like, wait, on the phone, is she going to ask me how many ideas I have? How does this work? You have romance, try romance. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, on the phone, Cleo was like, oh, I love the idea for book two as well. I was like, oh, thank mm -hmm. God, because I don't want to have to write another blurb. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so it, yeah, it came from the publisher. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was just very relieved that I wasn't going to have to come up with something. I mean, I have a whole book of like one line ideas, but for me, developing the plot is... <laughs> Really, I find that really hard. So I was glad I didn't have to do that again. That's fair. Yeah. Um, so we started seeing plans from publisher and editor already for the for the book, and the the release, which, which is it's April, right, in the UK? Yeah. So they're saying I think April, May, but nothing's yeah. um, confirmed yet. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's I, it's really exciting. I've seen like a concept cover and things like that. So it's just like everything that sort of comes through. I'm just it sort of becomes real all over again. Yeah. It's very weird. <laughs> what do you think you are most excited about to see? Or you may have already answered the questions. And a lot of people say the cover. So I mean, yeah, the the cover was yeah seeing the con because it's just still just a concept i've seen i've not seen like the final right so that's still really exciting but i think just like whole i think just like holding my book for the first yeah. time even because some people said i've heard some people say like by the time they got to actually having the book they you know they'd seen the cover they'd seen what it looked like so it didn't it wasn't that exciting whereas i am so excited to hold a book, <laughs> that's my name. Of course, because it makes it real. I mean, yeah. it, you, that is a real thing that was conceived out of your head. It did not exist. It's, you know, crazy. Yeah, so definitely, de definitely that. And then I think like the idea of seeing it in like a shop or something, yeah. if we're allowed to go to shops at any point. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so. Please, by next spring. <laughs> Is this is this process everything that you expected if you imagined kind of being a writer who gets an agent and then a book deal? Or is this, what do you expect out of this? Or do you have no expectations or just kind of go with it? I, the thing is, I can't actually, rem I can't pinpoint what I, ex what I expected it to be like. I, I mean, I follow, basically everyone I follow on social media is a writer or in the book world. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen a lot of people say, oh, it's nothing like you expect. But I, do, I, I actually don't know what I expected. And I do, yeah, like a huge amount of research into the industry. So I think I knew that it's, you know, it's slow. Things go slowly. And I knew that. <laughs> Um, so I wasn't sort of shocked by the, oh yeah, it's not coming out until next spring. Um, so, I mean, it's, my editor is fantastic. She's just wonderful. Um, and she's, she's very communicative. She's really collaborative. Um, so she's just been like a dream. Um, so she's made the process feel just very normal um and I feel really comfortable I felt very comfortable with her like immediately so that's made it a lot easier so I don't know if I'd you know had a different editor or different circumstances whether I might have felt a bit more sort of out of my depth but um 
a big thing for me, like the way I cope with sort of anxiety of any kind is to like understand something as fully as I possibly can. Yeah. So I think I, I'd already set myself up to um, know what the process was going to be like. Okay. And I think there's, a, there, there's a recurring theme when we speak to authors, they say that having a team of people around them who they trust and who they can kind of, who they can be themselves with is so important because if you are scared of your agent or you don't want to speak up to your editor, it's like it completely stifles your creativity and your autonomy with your words and your work. I, I yeah, I've been so I feel really really lucky because my agent sort of from the first phone call I had with her, I was like, yes, like I need to sign with this one. She just gets it. Not only does she get when they find her, which like, obviously you want an agent to get you. It's about you as a writer. It's not just about one book. So I, I remember one of the first things I asked her on the phone was, if you don't sell this, like what happens to our relationship? Do you drop me? And she was like, no. Oh, ask that, but that's so bold of you to ask that. That's so bold. I had listened to like a, a podcast where they were like, make sure you ask this question because some people don't realize that if the book doesn't sell, your agent's just going to let you go. So I was like, I was terrified because I'm not one for asking awkward, awkward questions or any kind of confrontation or anything like that. So I was really nervous to ask that. I was like, just do it because you need to know the answer. And she was like, no, like I'm in this for a writer's career. Like if you we don't sell this book, we'll sell another one. Just yeah. it's fine. So that automatically made me feel comfortable but she just we just got on really well and she seemed to just get me and then when I spoke to Cleo on the my editor on the phone once um she'd offered I remember we had a conversation we just talked for way longer than we had like in the diary and then I hung up the phone straight away. I called my agent and was like, I love her. Oh, that's great. I love that's just fine. Yeah. Um, so it's it's very much felt like a team. And they're both Kate used to be an editor before she was an agent. Oh. So we've worked we worked very closely together on editing it before she sent it out on submission. And then working with Cleo has felt just re I felt really, really comfortable to just discuss everything with her openly. And I was nervous about having an editor that, you know, you're, you're scared to say something or if they, if they suggest something, you're scared to push back or, you know, their changes aren't suggestions. They're just full on, like, you have to change this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the experience so far of working with those two has just, yeah, surpassed my expectations. That's good. And I think like it shows people that, uh, you know, again, this is like something that we talk about a lot, which is like there are human beings trying to not only do their jobs, but also connect to the people that they support. So this, you know, the industry sh is so kind of misunderstood, I think, sometimes, mm -hmm. because, you know, people see, you know, editors, publicists and agents in ivory towers when actually... They are just people who want to do the best for something that they're passionate about too. Exactly. I, it's because because of the way the industry is set up. You know, we think of these people as gatekeepers, and largely they are the, to the traditional world. But from my experience, everyone I've met so far in publishing is just they just love books and they love writers and they want to do well by their writers. So it's it's sort of turning the way you think about these people on its head and thinking, right, these, they're, they're not my bosses. Like we're on an equal relationship. We're a team that put a book out into the world. Yeah. And but it's so easy to, as a writer, and because you're, you almost feel grateful for being given a deal. Yeah. It, it's very easy to just be like, oh, okay, yeah, thank you so much. And yes, and, but yeah, I very much felt part of a team um, and not, like I'm in, an employee, which I think it's quite easy to. Do. <laughs> yeah, you never want to feel apologetic or beholden about no. what you're creating. Of course, exactly. I think one of the things that you that you've just said that is absolutely I've always always found to be true in my career is that people are there because they love books. Mm. They're not there for the money. I can tell you that. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right, so we get to this the part of the show now where we ask very hard-hitting questions. So just brace yourself, Leah. Okay. Right? If you could do anything else apart from doing what you're doing right now for work, what would you be doing? Um, I'd be in musical theater. Good choice. I love musical theater. Oh God, so do I. You have a lot in common. Oh really? <laughs> love music. Oh my god. Yes. Oh, just love musical theatre. It's the best. My family hates me. I just walk around singing show <laughs> tunes and they're like, here she goes again. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I was I was raised raised on it. <laughs> oh yes. I'm loving this. No, I just I like all and the thing is as well is I love so many musicals I love are uh, they're like Broadway first and like wait desperately for it to come over and then it comes over and yes, <laughs> buy tickets and go straight away. <laughs> I, um, when I was in high school, we went to uh, Radio City on a tour and we talked, you know, we talked to a rocket and I found out that I was tall enough to be a rocket. Oh, look at your face. Look at your, look at your face. You're so right. old. And it was like, Mom, and she was like, "Go to college, please go." <laughs> Do something else. <laughs> right. What if I go to college? Then can I try to be a rocket? And of course, by that, by that point, I was in publishing, and you know, there was no turning. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I did a stint off Broadway, and I my claim to fame was that. Oh no! So I also did. You know, the Friends episode where Monica is in a fifties um, costume yeah. and dancing on tables. Yes, that's what I used to do in New York City. It was called Ellen's Stardust Diner. Yes. <laughs> I was in there. Amazing. Oh, was it the best? I loved it. I love that place. But yeah, so that I was doing that and then- um, That's so I, cool. I managed to get into the final, final auditions for Rent back in, oh goodness me. It was, the year was 1999. Yes. Oh my goodness. So that was, I feel like that was a past life, but that you know. so cool. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. Is there anything that you could share? Although I feel like we do, we're, you know, this is just what we're talking about right now. Generally, lots of surprising things. But is there something that you could share about yourself or your writing process that people might be surprised to know? Oh, ooh. What <laughs> am I writing? Oh, my writing process. Oh God. Um, you know what? What you start your you know start your day off eating or music you listen to. You mentioned that. Um, yeah, that I've kind of given it away. I, I still think it's a weird thing, but apparently lots of writers do this. I have like specific playlists for each like point of view character, but I don't use it to listen to while I'm writing. <laughs> I, so when I was working in London, obviously now I'm not, but um, my commute home, I would listen to the playlist of, of I would listen to Naomi's playlist yeah. and like basically get myself into character by the time I got home. And then I would make myself stay in character until I could sit yeah. down and write. Um, but she's not like, she, no, she's a nice person, but she, she's not in the best place. So Psychologically, I don't know whether that was too wise. <laughs> but, yeah. That's like putting on a costume. I think yeah. it's great. It, well, it just, yeah, it really helped me because it's very, it's, the book is very in, it's not just, it's not like um, first person, but then telling the story. It's like you're in her head. So mm -hmm. it's great. I had to feel very in her head as well. Well, yeah. I'll try that. I'll completely freak out my husband. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Why are you suddenly walking around with lots of knives? <laughs> um, right. So, the last question is on the playlist for Naomi. Put him. Can you tell us one of the songs that's on the playlist for Naomi? Oh, for Naomi. Uh, see, I've got I've got my new characters playlist in my head. Um, for Naomi, one of her, there's a song by Sia. It's quite an old Sia song. They're called Breathe Me. I don't know if you've heard it. Yes. Um, it's gorgeous, but it's like heartbreaking. It's, yeah. it's sad. Um, that's one of them. Yeah. So 
should have a listen. <laughs> um, now, the last question that I'd like to ask is, has been historically very difficult to answer, and I've, I've, you'll understand why. Um, what is your desert island book? You're only allowed one. <laughs> it's like la la la. Um, desert island book. Oh gosh, that's really, really hard. Um, see, and I want to weigh up between two and I can't, can I? See, I have like a favorite book, but I don't know if it's a book that I would want on a desert island with me because it's really, it's depressing. Oh, no. I love The Handmaid's Tale, but I don't think I'd want it on a desert island. No, that's quite intense, yeah. Yeah, it's too intense for a desert. I think I might go with like a favorite YA book instead, just to take oh. my back to that time in my life. <laughs> um, oh, has anyone been able to answer this? It takes some time, actually. It's funny, we had, uh, we had Claire Fuller on the other day and she was like, well, the distinction is, do I, do I pick something that I love or do I pick something that I can dip into all the time? And mm -hmm. so that's kind of, that's the trick. That's true. Yeah. He also suggested a DIY book, but I was like, that's smart. <laughs> I think I might take Philip Pullman's, which one, which one do I want to take? Ooh. Which was my favorite? The what's the ninth one? Oh, it's the second one in the trilogy. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called. No, that one. Why can't I remember what it's called? I know. Why well, can't I? I can't remember the middle word now. Northern oh. Lights. No, not Northern Lights. The Golden Compass. Yeah. Is the subtle one? knife. The subtle knife. Yes. <laughs> that one. I take that. Yeah. I, I think Pullman is a great choice only because you can really just digest little bits and kind of sit with it. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I do have like a limited edition version, which is like all three of the books, in, but in one book. So wow. technically I could take that. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> You're very clever. That's the, that's the barrister in you. You're not a <laughs> loophole. Well, it will work for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so lovely speaking to you. Thank you. It's been really great. And honestly, like you've you've shared so much and you've kind of you've been very generous with kind of your process and how you approach crime fiction. And I think, you know, it just hopefully will make people find it a little bit less intimidating, you know, just approaching the process. Well, yeah, I hope so. I mean, when I was looking for an agent and then going on submission, which is so scary, um, it was things like this that really helped me. So you guys doing this is really great. Oh, thank you. It's been lovely having you on. It's been so great. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. That was so lovely. Honestly, like, again, recap. What do you think? Isn't it great? I mean, I think to me... Specifically, this is the first one that I re I don't know anything about crime fiction. I don't know anything about being a barrister and how do you how you approach that and what detail yeah. you know you have to put into a book. I mean, I can't really plot ahead, like I was saying in a previous episode, mm -hmm. unless I do nonfiction. Right. Because kind of fiction with crime fiction, right? You just have to put it all together and just kind of make sure it makes sense otherwise you're going in circles and then you know yep a lot of a lot of crime writers have uh have a, a process like that which i think is yeah. you know i mean for for me it's easy to see why that would become necessary yeah. um, and i just I, lo I love i have a very very soft spot soft spot for crime writers um so i've worked with a lot of them and i just it's it always amazes me the creativity and the cleverness uh, and how they come together. I really love it. I really, really love I, it. I think I would just be, by the time chapter three rolled around, I'd be like, all right, this person did it. Here's <laughs> like what happened. I can't, I just, that's it. That's the story. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I know to keep a secret like that just, you know, for however many pages, just, you know, and still surprise people. It's really, 
Yeah. To be able to do that well is incredible. Well, that's it from us. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, Leah Middleton, writing crime fiction, the process, two big deals, musicals. We've basically covered everything. <laughs> we really did. <laughs> and it was really fun. And I'm so pleased you guys were here with us. See you next week. <laughs>